First up, the custodial death of a father-son duo in Tamil Nadu's Tutukori has sparked massive outrage in the state. The death of the father and son following allegations of torture is snowballing into a major political row and has triggered calls for law enforcement reform. P. Jairaj and his son Benix were arrested for keeping their mobile phone shops open beyond permitted hours last Friday and died at the hospital four days later. The relatives alleged that they were severely thrashed at the Sathanakulam police station by police personnel. Following out Outrage, four policemen, including two sub inspectors, have been suspended. An inspector has also been benched by the state government. While Chief Minister E. Parneswamy announced ex gratia of 20 lakh for the family, he has been silent on the alleged torture. The case has also been taken up by the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court. Taking to Twitter, DMK Chief Stalin said that if the Tamil Nadu government does not carry out a fair probe, the DMK will file for a CBI inquiry into the case. And CNN News 18's Purnima Murali spoke to the Tutukori MP Kanimori, who has written to the NHRC over the custodial deaths. Listen in. What is the DMK's demand? Because there's outage pouring in that uh, there should be stringent punishment for those who. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, only after the public outcry and uh, once the political parties start to speak up because of the pressure that. They have even suspended, uh, you know, four officers. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was just uh, transfer. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I, they should uh, file an FIR mm -hmm. and uh, book this as a murder case and uh, issue arrest warrants and arrest these people who are uh, behind this. Mm -hmm. I don't understand, you know, why the government cannot do that. Mm -hmm. so and uh, you know, there are clear uh, guidelines also given by the. Human Rights Commission saying that uh, e even the same police station should not be investigating. Either it should be the CBCID or any other investigation agency which has to carry out the investigation. All the involved policemen must be charged under Section 302 of the IPC. A high level inquiry must be ordered to fix the culpability and identify lapses and also political accountability. Compensation of at least one crore rupees at least must be given to the family along with employment to be provided to family members. Purima Murli with me on the broadcast. Purima, has the post-mortem report come? What does it say about the cause of death? Well, the post-mortem was conducted uh, last Thursday and uh, they, we are waiting for the post-mortem report to be out uh, next week. Uh, the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court had already said that uh, this case is of uh, importance and that the post-mortem report should be submitted in a sealed envelope before the bench uh, by Tuesday. So by coming Tuesday, there will be some development and the post-mortem report will talk about the kind of injuries on the father-son duo and also the cause of death. Uh, so far, uh, the, the, the DMK uh, alleges that uh, the state government is covering up and there should be a fair probe. The state government says that they will wait for the postmodern report and uh, then react to this. And then they will file an FIR if, uh, if uh, the cause of death is known and if it's linked to what happened last Friday. And while we wait for those legalities, what is being done to ensure that evidence is not destroyed? Because from what I understand, there is lapse at the level of police at the Thana, there is lapse at the level of the hospital where they were taken, lapse at the level of the magistrate who referred them to judicial custody, and then finally at the jail as well. Well, Arunima, last week the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court had taken two or more to cognizance of the issue considering the public outcry and the outrage, and they have appointed... Uh, a magistrate to ensure that the post-mortem uh, is recorded uh, on a video and everything like he, uh, he is supposed to talk to the eyewitnesses to know the kind of uh, things that took place between Friday late uh, uh, last night, uh, late night to Saturday morning. So there is a magistrate appointed by uh, the uh, Madre bench of the Madras High Court to monitor the developments, to talk to eyewitnesses and to ensure that a fair probe is conducted into this because uh, there have been lapses at many stages and questions are raised at various points during this entire episode. So we will have to wait for uh, the, uh, the Madras High Court to hear this case this Tuesday and also what the magistrate has to say post uh, what he heard from the eyewitnesses, friends and family members.
All right. Purnima Murli, thank you so much for getting us all those details. It's a story which has taken not just the state of Tamil Nadu, but the entire country by storm. Uh, people are outraging amongst allegations of uh, sexual harassment as well. But we will have to wait and see whether the post-mortem report confirms that. And there's another shocker coming in from Andhra Pradesh now. It's a shocking incident of governmental apathy. Authorities in Andhra Pradesh, Shri Kakulam, towed away COVID-19 deceased on JCB excavators and tractors. While in Sompeta, the body of a deceased was carried away in a tractor, in Palasa, a 72-year-old coronavirus patient's body was placed on a mechanical digger and excavator by PPE-clad municipal personnel and taken away for cremation. After the incident came to light, the district collector suspended two civic body officials for their laxity in performing their duty and ordered a probe into the incident. Chief Minister Jagan Mohan Reddy called the handling of the incident an inhumane act and slammed officials for not following necessary protocols to shift the body. Now the stories coming up from both the states, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, and this clearly shows the stigma attached to COVID as well as now this particular incident where a body, a COVID body was, a JCB evacuator was used to move the COVID body to the crematorium. This raises questions that how aware are the municipal staff on the ground about the COVID guidelines. Now in both the states, the ministers have said that COVID guidelines have been briefed to the staff on the ground for, on how to handle the body and how to bury or cremated. But this incident from Palasa district in Srigakulam raises questions. It's also raised a lot of outrage among opposition as well as people. Action has been taken uh, on the municipal staff. One municipal inspector as a sanitary inspector have been suspended. But a similar incident was also reported from Soma Peta area which is also from the same district in Srikakulam where a tractor was used, an open tractor in which the body was wrapped. Well, that was used to take the body to the crematorium. Now, in the second incident, the collector has ordered for a probe and an action will be taken after the probe report comes out. To news from the world of politics, BJP President J.P. Nadda continued his attack on the Congress party for the second day today, saying that under the garb of China and Corona crisis, party president Sonia Gandhi should not shy away from answering questions that the nation wants answers to. He stressed on the charge that the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation got donations from Chinese embassy between 2005 and 2009. Yesterday, Nadda had said that the Prime Minister's National Relief Fund had donated money to the RGF, a trust shared by the Congress president when the UPA government was in power at the centre. NGOs and companies who had deep commercial interests, they have donated money to Rajiv Gandhi Foundation. This is what I would like to say straight and forward, that it is a shame sacrificing the national interest by accepting money from foreign powers in personal trusts. And the country wants to know what conspired between Rajiv Gandhi Foundation and the government of Chinese embassy, uh, government of uh, China. To that other big focus area, coronavirus pandemic, with 3,460 new cases, Delhi has breached the 77,000 mark. The ambitious serological survey to determine spread of COVID-19 has begun in the national capital today. The survey will cover over 20,000 residents, including those outside containment zones across 11 districts in the city. The results are expected to come in on 10th of July. The Delhi government has also ramped up testing and tracing aggressively in the city. Over 21,000 samples were tested yesterday, four times higher than any other state in India. Today, the corona of beds are about 13,000 beds in Delhi, which is about 7,000 beds. In June, where daily 5,000 tests were in the first half of June, today, Delhi, there are 20,000 tests in Delhi. तो हमने जितने लोग घरों के अंदर अपना इलाज करा रहे हैं सबके घरों में ऑक्सीमीटर भेज दिए आज से दिल्ली के अंदर सेरोलॉजिकल सर्वे शुरू हो रहा है बीस हजार लोगों का सेरोलॉजिकल सर्वे होगा घर घर के अंदर जाके सेरोलॉजिकल सर्वे कर रहे हैं जिससे पता चलेगा कि दिल्ली में किस लेवल पे कोरोना फैला हुआ है So what exactly is the serological survey? Starting today, field teams are fanning out across all 11 districts of Delhi for a serological survey. This will give authorities an accurate picture of what proportion of the population has been exposed to the coronavirus. Rupushi Nanda with the details. Delhi is in the next phase of its battle against the coronavirus. A serological survey on 20,000 people across 11 districts of Delhi 
both inside and outside containment zones. This test checks if antibodies are in the blood and by extension whether that person has been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Antibody survey in the population of Delhi will give us a periodic prevalence estimate of the number of people exposed as well as some idea of what are the levels of immunity that the Delhi population have developed and what proportion are still vulnerable and susceptible and need energetic protection. Field teams consisting of a doctor, a technician and a local level health worker are carrying out the survey. The surveillance is done by random sampling across all age groups including minors and will be done on both those with symptoms and those without. A zero survey already carried out by the ICMR showed less than 1% of the population in 83 districts were infected. But it also indicated that urban areas were more at risk. Previously, the study was limited to the containment zones of Delhi, whereas this one is going to be a random sample of all of Delhi. Generally, 20,000 is a reasonably good sample size for the city of Delhi. But it ultimately depends upon what the actual prevalence estimate is. The results of the serological survey will be available on July 10th and it will help authorities determine the proportion of population exposed to the infection. The findings are also critical in gauging whether Delhi has entered stage 3, the stage of community transmission. Post-Delhi, a serological survey is also planned for the high caseload cities of Mumbai and Ahmedabad. It is very much plausible that the serological survey here in Delhi will be completed on schedule. And with a robust sample of 20,000, it is also very likely that the survey will include people who live in the back of the beyond in Delhi, in gullies like the one that I'm standing in. However, the question remains, when will the result of that survey be made public? Because remember, a similar survey had been done for cities and we still do not know what the outcome of that survey was. This is important because it will have implications on the capital's COVID-19 battle. With camera person Raju Khetri in Delhi, Rupa Srinanda. Home Minister Amit Shah and Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal visited the 10,000 bed Sadar Patel COVID care center at the Radha Swami Satsang Bias at Chhatarpur today. The Home Minister and Delhi Chief Minister together with senior Home Ministry officials and MOS G. Kishan Reddy toured the hospital section of the sprawling 300-acre campus which is India's largest COVID facility. It will be run by the Central Armed Police Forces led by the ITBP. The facility has been developed under the Union Home Ministry supervision to meet the bed shortage amidst rising number of coronavirus cases in Delhi. ये हॉस्पिटल भी आज इतना बड़ा हॉस्पिटल मेरे काल से दुनिया में बड़ा हॉस्पिटल यही होगा 10,000 बेडेड हॉस्पिटल मैं भगवान से प्रार्थना करता हूं ये हॉस्पिटल का उपयोग ना हो क्योंकि पास टू पेशेंट जितना कम होगा तो उतना अच्छा है ये 10,000 बेडेड हॉस्पिटल हम लोग बनाए हैं जिसमें 2,000 बेड रेडी है आज के डेट में आप देख रहे हैं आपके सामने पड़ा हुआ है कि ये आज के डेट में हॉस्पिटल में यहाँ पे अगर मरीज की जरूरत पड़ती है दिल्ली शहर में कि हमें कोई और हॉस्पिटल में जगह नहीं है यहाँ पे वो भर्ती हो सकते हैं ये आपने देखा पूरा एयर कंडीशन हॉल है या ऑक्सीजन की जरूरत हो या बड़े हॉस्पिटल में शिफ्ट करने की जरूरत हो From Delhi to Maharashtra, with 5,224 5 new cases and 175 deaths in the last 24 hours, Maharashtra's total COVID tally rose to 1.5 lakh cases. The state has a positivity rate of 17.52% and a death rate of 4.65%. According to the latest data, only 26% of cases are from outside Mumbai, while 74% are from the state capital. The state government is gearing up for arrival of rapid antibody kits, which will be used for testing of infection in containment zones. According to the state authorities, 500 ICU beds have been added to the hospitals in anticipation of rise in cases due to monsoon. Asia's largest slum, Dharavi, had a high number of cases at the beginning of the pandemic. Thanks to BMC's relentless effort, the daily number of cases has dropped to single digits. How was this possible? Vinaya Deshpande tells us. In the first round of the fight against COVID, Dharavi, Asia's largest slum, has snatched victory against all odds. 2.16 square kilometers area for 8 lakh people. 
Social distancing is a meaningless phrase in this high density slum. So when the first covid case was detected here, fighting the pandemic seemed a lost cause. But the BMC's dogged mission Dharavi has taken it from three digit numbers in April and May to single digit numbers now. हमने एक ही चीज ध्यान में रखी कि अगर हम हर मरीज का इंतजार करते बैठे और फिर वो टेस्ट होके पॉजिटिव आके कांटेक्ट ट्रेसिंग करेंगे तो उसके लिए काफी टाइम जाएगा इससे अच्छा हम फीवर कैम करके प्रोएक्टिवली स्क्रीनिंग करते हैं पूरे हाई रिस्क जोन में और वहां से जो फीवर पेशेंट से उनको बाहर निकाल के आइसोलेट करते इट टॉक थारावी लेस देन 50 डेज टू गो फ्रॉम 0 टू 1000 केसेस but the state and PMC joined hands for Mission Dharavi and managed to screen each and every household. We have made a plan with the assistant municipal commissioner as booth level, we have a gutter promo and in charge of the booth booth of COVID-19 committee. And from that committee, we have a responsibility for 1200 people उस कोविड योद्धा के ऊपर रहेगी उनका जो भी रेशनिंग की व्यवस्था उनको जो भी प्रशासन की तरफ से मदद चाहिए वो उनके माध्यम से मिलना चाहिए काबिले तारीफ काम किया है मुंबई महानगर पालिका ने जो बीएमसी के बारे में नेगेटिव थिंकिंग थी वो अच्छी खासी पॉजिटिव में आ गई है और काफी काम स्टेट गवर्नमेंट के साथ मुंबई महानगर पालिका कर रही है धारावी गिव्स अ ग्लिमर ऑफ होप टू मुंबई व्हिच इज स्टिल एडिंग ओवर 1000 केसेस ईच डे इफ धारावी कैन Mumbai can. Vinaya Deshpande from Mumbai. And if Mumbai can, India can as well. Mumbai numbers going down, giving everyone hope. But there's no such good news for other metros, for example, Bengaluru. It is tightening containment efforts and ramping up testing after a spike in cases. A meeting of MLAs decided this would be preferable to reimposing a lockdown. Deepa Balakrishnan with the details. 28 MLAs cutting across party lines met in Bengaluru on Friday to brainstorm on taming the spread of the coronavirus. But even before the meeting began, one thing was clear. There was no question of another lockdown. It wasn't a strategy everyone agreed with. Our suggestion is to the government to save life of every people in the city and in the state. Because yesterday itself they told that we are not going to do lockdown and today meeting they said you give suggestions. So we have given suggestions that you have to increase facility, which they are telling we have increased, but then yesterday only we, we, are, we know rooms are not available in private hospitals. All parties, however, agreed on an aggressive containment strategy. These include a nodal officer for each of the 28 assembly constituencies in Bengaluru. All asymptomatic patients will be compulsorily moved to a COVID care center. Ayurvedic supplements to improve immunity levels. Testing swab collection kiosks in all 28 assembly constituencies. Centralized allotment of beds monitored by a senior IAS officer. Capping the time taken to shift a patient to a healthcare facility to eight hours and heavy penalties for violating mask and distancing norms. Every constituency uh, today or tomorrow will make a noodle officer because uh, patients uh, going to hospitals take now 24 hours now. Yes. So that, uh, we have to reduce that uh, to time. Once uh, positive uh, confirmed, within eight hours they have to go in the hospital or in the uh, hotels. hotels. There are about 1,200 active cases in Bengaluru now and the next 30 days is critical for IT City's battle against community transmission. Experts have often said that the main key is testing, testing and more testing. So Bengaluru will start testing as many as 7,500 samples every day from now, which is almost double than what Mumbai does at about 4,000 samples per day. In Bengaluru, Deepa Balakrishnan. Kerala is one state where numbers appear to be relatively under control, but yet people are being very careful. Neetu Kumar went around to public places and restaurants and got us this report about how people are being very careful. We are at Palayam in Thiruvananthapuram. In the pre-lockdown days, 
this place would have been passing with activity because this is one of the favorite joints for um, foodies across the uh, city. Uh, these uh, restaurants here would have been packed with people. Here now we can see that uh, chairs have been placed outside for those waiting for parcels that also following social distancing norms. Sanitizers and temperature checks are done. Records of people are being collected and only then people are allowed inside. In this restaurant here also, uh, we see that all social distancing norms are to be followed. Uh, sanitizers, temperature checks, people will be allowed inside this restaurant after uh, following uh, all these norms and in, in the four or five seater, only two people will be allowed across each other. In other news, a huge example of efficiency and skills from India's border road organization. BRO personnel have rebuilt the damaged Bailey Bridge in Uttarakhand's Pithoragarh district in a gap of just six days. 70 staff members were deployed to reconstruct the 120 feet tall structure. The construction of this bridge became very important due to the ongoing tension with China. With the construction of the bridge, it will also be easy to transport military necessities to the border. The bridge on the Senar drain close to Dhapa on the route leading to Munsiari was damaged when a Pokeland machine was being carried over it on a big truck. With the bridge fully reconstructed, vehicles have started operating on this route. My colleague Anupam Trivedi from News 18 with me on the broadcast. Uh, Trivedi ji, uh, the way we saw the visuals of that bridge completely collapsing, we didn't really think in six days it will be back to carrying more people. And, and those claps that we are hearing in these visuals tells us how important this bridge was. Yeah, Runuma, it's, it's one of the strategic bridge uh, connecting uh, uh, the remote villages of the uh, which are located on the Indo-China border. Hmm. And uh, uh, not only this is a road, this, this was a bridge important to the uh, security forces, ITBP and other Indian Army. It was also crucial for the locals. And some, it was 120 feet long bridge, which was built in a record six days time. And it was not an uh, easy task to complete in the six days. Hmm. It is a very difficult train. So uh, it is a, a sheer uh, fantastic work done by the border road organization, which they completed in the record time. Hmm. And I must tell you that it's a 65 uh, kilometers long road, which is being built from the Munshari to Milam. Okay. And this bridge out uh, somewhere in between. Hmm. And some 28 kilometers uh, road has already been constructed and 37 kilometers long. Road is yet to be constructed. So it was a very crucial break for the Indian forces and for the BRO okay. to complete the planting work of the road over okay. there. All right. Anupam Trivedi, thanks so much for joining us. Compliments to the Border Road Organization for completing this task in just six days. Moving on back to the National Capital Region. After Gurugram and other parts of Haryana uh, saw swarms of crop destroying locusts, uh, you know, they have now been spotted in the Greater Noida area. Delhi government has issued an advisory to deal with locusts. District magistrates have been advised to remain on high alert and coordinate with District Fire Department to make arrangements for pesticides. Earlier today, Gurugram City Administration warned residents, advising them to keep windows shut. The locust storms uh, not just uh, covered the busy MG Road and the Ifko Chok areas of Gurugram, but also DLF Phase 4, Chakarpur, Sikandarpur and Sukhraili areas. Delhi Environment Minister Gopal Rai chaired an emergency meeting over the locust attack. आप जाके देखोगे तो सड़कों के नीचे इनकी मरी हुई टिड्डियों के ढेर लगे हुए हैं। सर क्या ये केवल फसलों को नुकसान करते हैं या इसके अलावा पेड़ पौधों को भी या इंसान को भी नुकसान पहुंचाते हैं? इंसान को कोई नुकसान नहीं करते हरी चीज कुछ भी पेड़ पौधा दिखाई दे जाए पत्तों को साफ कर जाते हैं पूरा दिन करते हैं दूसरा ये है कि अगर जमीन पे खेत में बैठ जाता है तो ये वहां प्रजनन करके 3 4 6 इंच नीचे अपना वो लार्वा छोड़ देता है तो 15 दिन के बाद वो दोबारा टिड्डी का एक दल खड़ा हो जाता है तो ये बड़ा चिंता का विषय होता है कि नीचे जमीन पे ना बैठे पेड़ों पे बैठेगा तो उसको कम से कम प्रजनन तो नहीं करेगा A wrap of all the national news now. The Gurugram administration has declared eight wards as large outbreak regions. The administration has stated the large outbreak tag is given when there are 15 or more cases in a particular area. The Millennium City also plans to step up awareness amongst people residing in these areas regarding social distancing norms and the need to wear masks. Northeast is facing the dual challenge of coronavirus and floods. Over 35 people have been killed since March in floods and landslides. Large parts of the Pobitara Wildlife Sanctuary have been inundated. NDRF is aiding in evacuation. 
A smart machine has been installed at the Indore International Airport to ensure social distancing. The smart machine has artificial intelligence sensors and warnings are relayed whenever social distancing norms are violated. When humans are not smart enough, we have to rely on machines. That's it from me, but news and updates continue. Thanks for watching.